This is Gestoras. Today's episode is in English. El episodio de hoy de Gestoras es en inglés. Pueden leer una transcripción en español en nuestro sitio web o pueden ver el episodio en YouTube con subtítulos en español. Gestoras Podcasts brings you conversations with cultural managers from the North and the South. We celebrate the work of Latina cultural managers sharing their stories of success, challenges, and lessons learned. This week, I'm alone in the studio speaking to Carmen Marquez. Carmen is the Director of Programs and Education for Harmony Project. Harmony Project provides high-quality music education to the underserved communities of Los Angeles through a holistic approach. A champion of community empowerment, Carmen is currently a fellow of Sphinx Lead Cohort 5, Leaders in Excellence, Arts, and Diversity, a prestigious two-year leadership program designed to evolve the industry landscape by empowering the next generation of executive leaders. Carmen Marquez, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Gestoras. I'm very grateful that you made the time to talk to us. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. It's it's really exciting to have you here and you have such a cool life story and, and such a beautiful approach to the work that you do. I'm excited for more people to hear about it. But let's start with arts discipline that you're in, music. What led you to music? I, I think inherently I got it from my dad because my dad was a, a musician in Mexico. Um, he used to be part of a band. Um, he, he was never classically trained, but... Um, I think by nature that kind of pulled me into music. Um, I did start, you know, in fourth grade with the elementary school. I was never good at it. <laughs> I, I I don't think I was very good at it. I struggled a lot. I couldn't read music. It took me I was confused and lost with rhythms and but I but I knew there was something that was pulling me towards the violin. Um and it wasn't until I went to a music camp in uh, Arrowhead, where I was just surrounded by amazing musicians, um, very talented, same age as me in like um, sixth grade. And I was like, what the heck? Why can't I play like that? <laughs> so after that camp, I just went home and I, I, I went and I picked up a, a violin concerto, the always violin concerto in A minor. And I learned the whole thing by myself. As one does. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I learned it all by myself. Um, I, you know, taught myself the technique, and wow. I know it wasn't probably the best technique, but I was so committed and so passionate to just learning it. Um, and 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 then I, you know, I just kept going and I kept going, and I just it just became part of my life. Did, what was it about music that did something for you that other things had not? That got you to that level of commitment and passion to teach yourself to play a violin concerto? I think it's the, the passionate person in me, the, the perseverance part of me that if I cannot do something well, I want to learn it, how to do it well. Even if it takes me a longer time to learn something than other individuals, for me, the commitment towards Um, understanding something that's complex and understanding um, why something is so complex and why can it be easier, right? Um, so for me, really, it was the, of course, listening to a lot of classical music. Um, I was very passionate. It drew me in. Um, I've never been really well at expressing my feelings. And the classical music really made that connection with me in terms of This is what the feeling of angry, you know, feels. This is the feeling of sadness, the feeling of um, disappointment. Um, I couldn't, I was never, I was not raised to label my feelings, right? So I think that's why music was a very big part of my life because inadvertently, like not necessarily on purpose, but not learning how to talk about feelings and um, in, in, in a Mexican household setting, I think classical music opened a different world of like it's all about emotions it's all about feelings and so for me I think probably that's the reason why I kept going on with it and it gave me some stability it gave me something um practicing my instrument 
gave me the tools to to really just look forward to something. Um, it was an anchor um, because, you know, mom was working the night shifts. Um, dad was always a little bit cold. Um, so I think coming home to practice the violin just gave me that stability in that safe space that this is not chaotic. I know what to do. I know what's coming up. I know my process of practicing, set up my chair, set up my stand. I work through these um, pages and I, I think it, it, it was a form of connecting with my emotions in a form of creating some stability in, in a beautiful, chaotic Mexican house court. That makes a lot of sense. That's really beautiful. And you've talked about how, um, you know, growing up in this Mexican household, not being, you know, trained or encouraged to show your feelings impacted your connection, right, to music. In what other ways does your Mexican cultural heritage, your Latino cultural heritage, shaped your life, um, shaped your approach, even professionally to, to what you do? I think not necessarily in general, the Mexican culture, but I think my own um upbringing in terms of um i think there's a lot of <clears throat> you know i think it's not until we grow up that we realize hey there's a lot of generational trauma here that we haven't healed from that um you have to be very very self-reflective and very honest with yourself um i think right now personally what i'm going through right now is a realization of I, I cannot avoid these attachment wounds that I've been dealing with in terms of like, you know, um, mom dealing with her own anxiety and not giving me that um, words of comfort or how to express love with words. Um, I think that all of that is, um, you know, it's learning compassion towards my parents that they had their own marital problems. And I think all of that um, has shaped me to, one, um, look for an outlet. And I think that outlet was music, my violin. I think also it gave me the courage to, to really spend a lot of time with myself. For me, I felt like I grew up in a very isolated manner where I like classical music, right? That's not a common thing in a Mexican household, I think. Um, I play the violin um, year after year after year. I never stopped. And I think as an individual, um, when I look back and I think, well, what is it that I missed along the way that I don't have the skill sets to develop um, healthier relationships or to be really honest about what is it that I missed when I was younger that I need to give myself now that I need to be responsible for. And so for me, that looks a lot like honesty, curiosity. Where is this anger coming from? Where is this anxiety really coming from? Where is the sadness really coming from? How <clears throat> deep does it go? Actually, I did my first yoga class on Thursday. How did it go? I cried. <laughs> and then I was like, wow, like. So it went well. Yeah, these wounds go really deep. Deep. I already knew they were deep, but they go so much deeper. And I think it's good for me to 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 realize this now because I understand why when I play certain things in music, I'm so passionate about it. Why Tchaikovsky is so passionate for me. Um, why, you know, something like the Conan's Violin Concerto is so like eerie to listen to. And, and, and it gives me a sense of connection with my true individual self without the materialistic barriers that come with it, without feeling shame for feeling my feelings. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to say anything. I just have to listen. But I think being Mexican in the classical world setting gives us a unique perspective towards understanding why we're so passionate about music. So uh, you taught yourself to play the violin, essentially, 
and uh, kept on teaching yourself how to practice, uh, teaching yourself more pieces. At what point uh, did you do your formal training and what was your life like as you were embarking on that? Yeah, my formal training happened probably in the middle of my eighth grade year. Um, I asked my orchestra teacher for recommendations on, on, on private instructors and she recommended her former teacher's wife. Um, my, my, my orchestra teacher was a cellist, so her, her teacher married a violinist, um, Miss Joan Baker. Um, this lady, <clears throat> let me tell you something. She's, she's an angel. She's godsend. I think she was really, I would say she's the reason why I'm here. The reason why I made it to where I am now in my career. Um, Funny story, though, when I first auditioned for her, quote unquote, on my first um, a lesson, she told me I was too old, that I had missed the mark to catch up where I needed to be, right? So I went home. I was so sad. I was very sad. <laughs> uh, I was like, no, I can't be. Like, why am I too old? Like, where in life did I miss the manual that I can't be a violinist? Like, who? who made that role, right? So I went back to my orchestra teacher and I was like, listen, like, I really want to learn violin. Like, this is, this is it. Like, she told me I'm too old, right? And again, it's that, like, I think it's that Mexican inside of me, like, you told me I can't do it. I want to go do it. <laughs> so I went back to her again and, um, you know, she, she said, okay, like, I'm going to take you as a student, but like, you need to practice every single day, right? Um, at that point she was charging $45 for 45 minutes. And, um, you know, my parents made the sacrifice for like the first two years and I practiced, I practiced a lot, two hours, two and a half. That's the first thing I did when I got home, you know, my dad took me uh, to my classes all the time. And then I, you know, she told, I told her at one point, I'm like, you know, it's just, it's too expensive. Like we, this is a burden financially for my parents. And so then she was able to, to provide those lessons on, on scholarship. And she told me like, keep practicing, keep working really hard. Um, don't worry about it. Like that's all I need from, from you. Wow. Yeah. She really, really took me under her wing. And, and um, I think with her, I learned how to be even more expressive of my feelings with music. She really untapped um, and nurtured my, I don't think she nurtured my talent. I think she really nurtured my, my soul. I think the nurturing that I was missing, um, I think she really gave me that nurturing that I was longing for from a, an individual. And I think she instilled in me, um, what it is to be to be given because she was very giving with me you know when i had a a big performance with the music teachers association of california convention she gave me money to buy a dress and she i told her i'm like i don't have money it's like i don't where am i gonna stay at a hotel like i don't have money hotel so she you know she made accommodations for me and she dropped me back and she really taught me what compassion and what giving wholeheartedly with no strings attached is. Really lovely. Yeah. And um, at the same time, you know, I learned I am Mexican. I don't belong in this world because um, I remember one time, you know, my dad was waiting in the car for me to have my lesson. And I guess a neighbor thought he was like being suspicious. He called the cops on my dad. And my, my dad must have been so scared. But you know what he said? If you don't know anything, don't fear, right? So he told the police officer, like, my, my daughter is having her violin lesson. Mm -hmm. And so my teacher got an officer in my lesson. She took her violin. Yeah, she took her violin. With her hand. She's like, oh, it's the police. I'm like, what? And then, um, obviously, she had her violin in her hand, you know, a nice, older, 
you know, white lady, um, you know, was in question. And so they left. And I was like, wow, like, as an, you know, I, I can, I, I've never really sat down and, and, and understood what my dad went through, but importance of compassion, like, you know, you're trying to do something for your daughter, for your family, you know, you believe wholeheartedly that this will take your daughter somewhere. And this incident happens. And I was like, that's the reality of, you know, situ- that was the, the hardest reality that I had to deal with. And I think I was more in shock than anything else. But, you know, um, I am grateful, though. I'm grateful for for, for Miss Joanne Baker. She's remembering that I, I have to go pay her a visit. So <laughs> Yeah, she sounds incredible. Yeah. And your dad, even after this incident, kept taking you, kept taking you to, to the lessons? To, to the lessons, to rehearsals, anywhere I needed to be with a violin. He, he was there and he took me and he sat in the car. And so I, I think that's music brought him and myself closer Hmm. and also he like because I wasn't driving in my first year of college oh by the way Miss Joan Baker also paid for my first year of college wow yeah so my dad took me also to 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 college and and he drove me my university was about 20 minutes away from his job so him and I would wake up 5 a.m he would drop me off at school at 6 a.m. And literally I would be there for like 10 hours, 12 hours. Uh, life of, me, of a musician, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's, he's been probably a very uh, important figure in my musical career. That's horrible what happened to your dad. That's really, really awful. And it speaks to his, his love for you and his belief that this was a, a path for you that he kept, you know, going and um, driving you, even though he knew that could happen again. Um, did you run into things like that yourself? Did you ever feel like your Mexican identity was either a flashpoint for some people or an, or an issue? Yeah, I think I see it more with my parents. It probably happened to me, but I probably have not processed it or maybe didn't process it because I was so young. But I would say once I was out there in the real world in college, um, away from the umbrella of my parents. Um, there's always been a little bit of standing up for them, um, standing up for the advocating for them, um, especially in the healthcare side of things. Um, you know, when things are not taken seriously for them or um, they get giving, you know, pushback on like, you know, we're not able to do this or that then I I have to be that advocate for them, you know, and that's hard because when you're 18, 19, you know, you're dealing with, first of all, being the life of a musician and then trying to fit into the world. And then you have this other weight on your shoulder of, oh yeah, I have to, you know, I need to take care of my parents. Um, I I think it's always been something that's going to stay with me, even at this age and not that I'm about to be 35. Being an advocate for them is it's a job that will always be there because society has not given them their place of your needs matter. Um, and it, that language barrier creates that. It creates the necessity to be like, well, if you can't speak your needs in my language, that your needs don't really matter. Sure. And so for me, it's that's how I learned how to navigate things, right? Um, mm-hmm. How to navigate the system, because sometimes you have to know the system to be able to get what you need. Sure. And it's not until you say the right words, the right combination of words, um, do people actually want to help. Right. Yeah. And so that's, that's something that I, you know, I want to also help train my parents, like Hmm. in terms of, I may not always be available, but this is how you do things. It's a good balance when something does become a very big roadblock 
I would like to think that I'm there. You spot on that it's not just about the language, it's about learning the codes, learning the codes and the maps. And sometimes even if you are not proficient in the language, but you know enough about how things work and what the codes are, like you said, like how to how to ask for something, how to express something, you can get by a bit. So yeah, it's it's very tricky to be in this country and not understand those codes and not well in any country or not speak the language. Yeah, I call it speaking Caucasian. You gotta learn how to speak Caucasian. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you you persisted, you kept going and you went to grad school. Grad school was um it was very hard. It was very difficult. You know, when I was doing my undergrad, I wanted to pursue violin performance. I got discouraged from seeking that. Um, again, because I was years behind, you know, colleagues start their training when they're three, they're four with private lessons. I started my former training when I was 14. Um, and so in undergrad, I didn't have the right tools. I had a very inexpensive violin that I was uh, using. Um, very expensive at the time for me, um, you know, $3,000, but it was better than what I had. And so by the time I, I wanted to move on to grad school, I knew I wanted to do violin performance because I was told no again, right? Of course. Thus, you had to do it. Of course. I had to do it. Like, there was no other option for me anymore. I was looking for a teacher that would really, really focus on technique. Um, and I found a great teacher. Um, her name is Andrea Byers. She studied with uh, Ivan Galamian at, at Juilliard. And she... She took things to the next level with me. Um, she pushed me a lot. <clears throat> I think for her, <clears throat> it was the first time where I felt like she didn't care about my former training. She didn't care what I looked like. She didn't care about the barriers. About She just cared about the violin, hmm. how I was playing it, and how I represented her studio. And I think it was the first time that I just felt seen as a human being. And it was nice. It was great. I mean, there were times where I was in tears in lessons. Um, I felt like I was finally um, trained the way that I needed to be trained, that I wanted to be trained, which is to not be considered what age I started the violin. It doesn't matter. You know, great teachers in classical music will dissect your playing and will teach you how to do it and will teach you how to combine technique and artistry together to produce real results that uh, are reflective of the high artistry that classical music can pull out of individuals. And so she did something for me that I, I never thought I would. I, my playing transformed in two years um, to an artistic level that I have always been wanted to reach, but didn't know how to do so. And at the same time, it was a big lesson. Um, it was the first individual that said, you know, in order for you to be better, you have to be honest about where you are now, right? So she did that with a recording device, old school recording device, recorded my lessons, played it back to me. Well, what do you think? Do you like how you sound? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So let's do it better. I'm like, okay. Um, so f for me, that was really important. Um, it, it, learning to reflect on exactly where I am in the moment was the biggest lesson that I've ever learned with with in life. Um, I, and I know I know it was only related to the violin then, but for me now, it's it's been a constant. Um, it's been a constant in my life um, to reflect back exactly where it is that I am doing and, 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 and setting intentions. So with her, I understood technique and musicality go together. You can't separate them. A very important phrase that she said to me one day was, I can teach you this piece. She was referring to the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. She's like, I can teach it to you. And that was very reflective of the teacher that she is. She didn't base it on my potential. 
She based it on her potential. Me, I am your teacher, and I will show you how to dissect this piece so that you can perform it successfully. And I did. I, I, I did it for my graduate recital. And then I also added a, of course, a Mexican piece, mm -hmm. Estrellita by Manuel. I think grad school was also very difficult because it was also very prominent that no matter how hard I practice, no matter how much I evolved in my individual studies, not everybody wants the same for you, right? And 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 I don't want to make assumptions, but I know I, I knew it had something to do with the color of my skin for sure, um, because. I was always in the same chair and orchestra, always, every year, every semester. And at one point, I had to be like, hey, why is this happening? You know, I, I talked to the conductor. I'm like, if I have a bad audition, move me back. Right. I accept the consequences. I take the responsibility. If I had a great audition, you know, move me forward. But Literally, I was second chair of the second violins every semester. To me, that was a harsh reality of not everybody appreciates <clears throat> or shares your successes or sees you as a person. So gra grad school was a big awakening in terms of the hierarchy of classical music and what it's doing to people of color. As much as I enjoyed my individual studies, I didn't enjoy playing orchestra anymore. It became a chore. Um, even though we were playing these fantastic pieces, uh, Mahler and, you know, Tchaikovsky and Brahms, and, you know, we were doing the great orchestral works. And for me, it just felt like, like, I, like my sound didn't belong in this orchestra. Right. It was the first time it was very prominent to me that people of color in the classical music have, a lot of barriers to still overcome and still and, and even now because I graduated back in 2015 almost 10 years ago I don't know if that's what led me to to pursue what I'm doing now administratively but certainly took a lot of emotion a lot of perseverance to to just complete the degree I took a semester off because it was the reality of things were so harsh and I, I did come back and I, I did finish the degree. I, I'm, I'm grateful that I did finish because my success should not depend on other people's perspective of me, you know. So for me, it was important that I finish the degree. It was a personal. By then, it was just personal. I need to finish this. I need to get through it. And because this is this is my story and other people shouldn't have that opportunity to control how my story will end or where it goes. And your story hasn't ended yet for sure, but right now you're in a very, very special place and you are you are in a leadership position in uh, the Harmony Project. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Harmony Project, it provides high quality music education to the underserved communities of Los Angeles through a holistic approach. And Carmen is the director of programs and education for Harmony Project in Los Angeles. So. What do you do and what kind of skills do you need to, to do the job that you do? Well, what I'm learning right now, stepping from, a, uh, I was formerly a manager um, of programs and now I'm a director of programs. So what I'm trying not to do is I'm trying not to act as a program manager, right? I'm trying to give autonomy to program managers to run the sites. Um, our sites can hold up to 200, 300 students in a week um, of classes and ensembles. We have beginning, intermediate, and advanced orchestras, and we provide coachings and sectionals to students along with private lessons. We have a very strong tie to the community in Los Angeles, and families in Los Angeles are very passionate about music. I've never seen families be so passionate. And maybe it was because in, when I was doing things, my family, my parents weren't as, as involved. They were driving me, but they were not, you know, they're socializing. But our parents, they know each other. Um, they, uh, some of our students have been with us for for years, seven, eight years. So what I do right now, and I'm trying to find my place in the organization, meaning, you know, there's always a hiring 
sheet and these these are going to be your scopes of work and and the skill set that we need but i think every organization is different right and it's like how do i bring my skill set that i have and offer them to an organization that i like to describe as a beautiful chaos um, programming is always a beautiful chaos uh, because our end result is always beautiful but seeing how the sausage is made is not always so pretty so for me, what I am trying to do is I'm trying to develop talent. I think that's that's my job. I think that's where I'm finding myself. Hmm. Develop program managers to be at their best, to inc- uh, elevate uh, expectations, uh, because our families deserve the best. Um, because I, w- you know, I was one of those kids. My parents were those families. And I think that it takes a lot of compassion to understand why I'm setting the bar a lot higher than what people are used to. And I think that also comes with the level of understanding people relationships. Um, Because as I've seen transitioning from manager to director, um, there's less paperwork involved, but there's more more of managing people, right? Managing relationships and understanding uh, report, understanding people's skill set, uh, understanding what their goals are, and really it it brings it down to more of a humanity level, I think. And at the same time, understanding. How will I develop talent that's currently there? But also the the easier way is to just bring my own talent, right? Go find the talent that I need, that I want, and and just elevate programming. But I think for me, what's the biggest challenge right now is developing talent that has been part of the organization. And how is it that I can share my current trainings that I am getting from the Sphinx organization. It's a leadership program, um, administrative leadership program for people of color. Um, I'm part of cohort five. Um, very lucky to be part of such a group of administrators that are of color and are in leadership as well. So um, what I don't do is I don't, I don't micromanage. I give a lot of trust, but trust comes with a lot of accountability. I learn every day. Every day I learn from people. Um, I I want to learn from people because I'm only going to be successful if they are successful in their job. And for me, it's important to continue um, sharing and developing talent because the communities of LA serve, deserve the best. Tell me, what is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job is learning where I am in the layers of programming. So, for example, you know, programming for students, parents. We have our 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 site assistants, our interns. We have our program administrators, program managers, and then there's me. So that layer, that focus, that that perspective of being even further away from from students, and that has been so interesting for me to to navigate. Like, where is it that I find myself in in that layer, and how is it that I can best be a teacher? Not necessarily because I've been a teacher, right? I'm a teacher at heart, and I'm not a teacher to my students anymore. I would like to be a teacher to program managers and how it is that we navigate this because I am that layer between programming and ex- and executive leadership, right? I- I'm right. that extra layer. And I think for me, what's interesting is, I guess, people don't understand that there's a level of influence that comes with being part of leadership, Right. So if you tell me your goals and your dreams, my job is to try and execute your goals and your dreams. And I think for me right now, that's 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 my favorite part of programming is I think a lot of people don't realize when they tell me things in passing, how those things I, I'm, I'm keeping a hold of so that we can execute it right. and we can bring it up 
to our executive director and our board and be like, hey, we have this idea that was brought on. Because honestly, being director, it's not about making my wishes come true. It's about making our staff's dreams come true and how they want to take programming. Because they work at such a personal level that I don't have that anymore. Because I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm further away from that layer of the core of programming. And so for me, it's I'm not here to make my vision come true. I'm just here to be a voice for the people that have that connection with students, and to hopefully in the next three to five years implement those changes. So. I, I think that's been my favorite part is people think that I'm here to bring my changes. I'm here to make some sort of change, some sort of dictatorship. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm here for. I'm really here to be your voice and to really elevate it and to really pass it on so that in passing, right, this is a stepping stone for me. Maybe I'm not sure yet, but the changes that are going to be made are the changes that you right. want to see, not the changes that I want to see. Right. Right. And so for me, that's that's been my favorite part right now. It's understanding that scope of where I am. Either I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm a little bit further away from programming than I would like to be, because I would like to be on the field every day teaching kids, right? But I can't have an impact at that level anymore. I need to I need to do more. So for me, it's it's been navigating and, and learning and understanding um exactly what's gonna be needed how I can build report and how is it that I'm going to leave a footprint in this organization. And that's not leaving my footprint. It's going to be just honestly elevating what people have been wanting to see or been missing. And so, and hopefully at the same time, understanding and, 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 and them reflecting what it is that they might be missing. They didn't know that was missing. Right. Um, so for me, it's really to make, hopefully, my team's dreams come true. I think that's what I'm here for. I think, um, I hope that one day, you know, I want to have time already by my side to see where it is that I am in right now, right? Like, oh yeah, remember this little battle that happened that was so silly, where we are now, right? And understanding who is going to be on my side, who's going to be there championing. And I think that's going to be the, the, the funnest part of it is in three years from now, Look who was by my side. Look who wasn't. But look what we did, and look what we achieved. You mentioned that you were well. You are a fellow in the Sphinx Lead Program, which is a very prestigious program for developing developing leaders of color here in the U.S. Talk talk to me a little bit about that. About how how being part of that program, part of that cohort, has helped you advance as a leader, as an arts manager. I applied a couple months. Uh, when I was hitting a wall in my former organization um, where I was burned out, um, I was working um, tremendous hours during COVID to serve our families. I was out there distributing supplies, instruments during times of COVID before we had a vac vaccine. Um, but I knew somebody had to do it, right? And so I, I did it. And um, I feel very proud of that. Um, I blended ear an ear to our families. And so for me, when I started to advocate for myself as a person of color, um, the response was, well, maybe this isn't for you. And that was hard to hear because I was doing the right thing for our families. I was the main point of contact. A lot of our families are were Spanish speaking families. I was the only one in the team that spoke Spanish. And it was hard to hear, but at the same time, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear how people looked at me, the potential that they saw in me. And so I took initiative. I took some time off. And when I came back, I researched uh, for a mentor. And I got a mentor from the TENT organization that provides mentorship to um to immigrants and people of color. And I got paired up with um, Heather Neville from Sony organization, PlayStation. Uh, she's the vice president of people operations. And again, like I met an individual that didn't care how I looked like or whoa, you know, where I came from and just really gave me the words to learn how to navigate the system, 
right? How to navigate um, the culture that's company culture because Sony PlayStation, very different than classical music. But at the same time, there's a lot of barriers that people of color face. And so through her words of wisdom, I, I was able to grow from coordinator to associate to program manager in about two years. But I was coordinator for about almost four years before that even came a realization. Um, so with her help and, and, you know, learning that Caucasian language, corporate language, um, that really helped me to, to blend, right? I blended. I was doing exactly what I needed to do. And I had to pick my battles as a person of color. Um, what battle am I going to win today? Well, right now, the battle that I need to win is blending in, saying yes. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I can do that. Of course I can do this. Of course I can go clean a 200 plus inventory of islands and fix them up for our partnerships. Of course I can do that. <laughs> right? right? You don't need to send them to the violent job, right. you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I did that, but I also did it with compassion for the students because students have no idea what it is that goes behind the stage um, of putting programs together. Nor do they need to, right? It's like it has to, they need to have a smooth, a place that they feel safe and where they feel things are coherent and make sense. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I, like I said, programming is always a beautiful chaos. So. Um, you know, once once I was able to run my own sites and build my own team with the teachers that I wanted, um, and I, you know, the, the program really flourished. I, I left a very well-oiled machine uh, with the team, Dream Team, and I'm very proud of that. And um, I, I know for me, learning how to, one, advocate for myself, learn the skill set outside of work, you know, so I, I took a lot of college classes um, for the community college, Excel classes, um, very boring classes that is software, <laughs> but it's necessary as an administrator. I did a certificate in nonprofit management. And then and then I applied to Sphinx, you know, when I was doing all of these. I didn't get in the first year. That's okay. Um, but I went through the interview process, which was great. And then the next following year, I, I applied again. And I, by that point, had a year of coaching with Heather. I was already, you know, advocating for myself very strongly. And so I knew what I wanted. Right. And so I was able to articulate what I wanted to do as an administrator. And that's to elevate programming for people of color and have and be an advocate for our families of color. Um, and the only way to do that, I think, is beyond playing the violin. It's really being in the administrative sector of things and really learning what other institutions are doing, right? So I, I you know, I got accepted into the program. Um, I was able to uh, meet my cohort members. And they all they come from everywhere in the country, so it was really nice to finally meet a people that were going through the same struggle as I was. Um, how do we change things in the institutions so that people of color, not only ourselves, have a better voice, but at the same time, how do we bring that to our, you know, programming that we all do or we're involved in, right? Some of us do marketing, some of us do, some of us do, but at the end of the day, we're all working towards a common goal, which is to elevate our own communities. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's been great. I mean, learning that I'm not alone and learning that I have, you know, 10 other individuals I can go to for advice. Um, and you know what? At the end of the day, our, our struggles are the same. Yeah. So we're only growing in numbers. And you're right that the most powerful thing you can do uh, or role that you can have to make change is to actually be in the administration of these organizations, actually be the leadership, be running them. So um, you, you're absolutely right on that. What advice or what would you do you wish you had known when you were starting out um, in these leadership roles that 
uh, or as, as you were entering this field, you know, making the shift from mu- being a musician to the administration, what do you wish somebody had given you a heads up about? I wish somebody would have told me that the higher you go, the lonelier it gets. Harmony Project and the former organization I was part of are made of very different dem- demographic. I'm now in an organization that has a large number of people of color. And even so, the struggles are, I think, even a lot more difficult because sometimes your own communities get very, um, I don't want to say resentful, but there's something there where one of us is succeeding Mm-hmm. it just can't be, you know, like, yeah. like it, we can't just always rally. And so um, for me, that's been a really harsh reality that, you know, even with people that look like me, it, it's not getting any easier. Yeah. It's getting more difficult Yeah, because now I have to learn a new language. Right. 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 I don't know what that language is, but I'm learning. I'm learning that um, people don't like to be, I think, the compassion of what it is to um, to want to be at the leadership level. Mm-hmm. For me, it's not great. For me, it's I want to make a positive change. And I think sometimes... Um, we lose focus of that. Like, why is it that we are doing this? And, um, and we're, it's, it's been a struggle, you know, it's, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't gotten easier. You know, my executive director is a person of color and, um, she's, she's been great. She's been wonderful. Um, so for me, I understand right now that it's going to be a lonely road. Mm -hmm. Um, because for me, I have to stay objective and learn how to navigate a new reality of learning a new language. And once I know what that language is, I'll I'll share it with people. It's very true what you say. And I think it's the most painful part of leadership. The most painful part of leadership as a a non-Caucasian is when you begin to try to make things to do change and you come to leadership, not from a sense of ambition or power, but you come to it because you want to make things, want to make change and you want to put your skills at the service of your people. And suddenly Mm -hmm. at one point it's your people who are the, who are the most critical or the most um, antagonistic and who begin to maybe think up a narrative of you that is not nowhere close to what, (laughs) what you are, you represent. Right. And that is, extremely painful and extremely hard. I haven't cracked that one yet. I think it might have something to do with the fact of um, of being powerless, of people being so powerless. And then when someone is in a position of authority, that um, you are in a position of authority to serve, but it begins to be seen as a position of authority that has power. So I think something happens when, when people are begin to you know climb ladders of, of power within organizations that it becomes you're the person who holds power, thus you're the person who can cause da- damage, thus you're no longer one of us, right? There's a, an othering that happens there that is really, really hard. And the work that Sphinx is doing in this in this sense is, is incredibly important, incredibly powerful, because as you said, you now have 49 friends across the country, 49 other people who are experiencing exactly what you experience, right? And it's it's really it's really important because it can get incredibly lonely. We're nearing the end of our time, so I'm going to, as you know, we ask every one of our guests to leave a question for someone else um, and uh, to answer a question that someone else has left for them. So are you ready for me to ask you a question somebody left for you? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, So this one was left uh, by Lia Uribe, who actually has several points of contact with you. She uh, wanted to play the piano. She went to the conservatory and wanted to play the piano, was told she was too old. Um, to play the piano because she was 13, right? So the same experience that you had. Um, so instead she switched to the bassoon and is a very, very, very accomplished bassoon player. Anyway, so Leah left this question for you. When was the last time you were a window and when was the last time you were a mirror to someone? You know, I, I had my first individual, a possible mentee reach out to me. 
that they want to connect with me um, and learn from me as to how I, you know, climb the ladder. I'm still climbing the ladder. Um, uh, I know I'm, I'm at a stepping stone. I know I'm not near, near where I want to be. So I, I think that's going to be interesting and uh, helping, you know, being a window to someone into my personal struggles. And uh, because this isn't codified somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody gave us a lucky break, right? For so, sure. And I know for me, I know for me, that's my executive director. You know, we, I got a job offer less than 12 hours after my interview. Um, because we were on the same page about helping communities. And so I will always be grateful that, you know, she's entrusted me with the direction of how we're going to take programming because that's all we do is programming. And then what was the second part of the question? When was the last time that you were a window? So I think that's in your, in your mentorship, right? And when was the last time that you were a mirror to someone? I think to myself. (laughs) I'm a big mirror to myself, I, I've been on this path of trying to heal from attachment wounds and generational trauma. And that's taking a lot of self-reflection sure. and not just self-reflection on the superficial, but self-reflection as to bringing curiosity to what's behind the emotion of the emotion. Like, where did it all start from? Where did my sadness first really where is it, how deep does it go? How deep is it rooted? How deep is the anxiety rooted? Because it's anxiety is a symptom of many different other emotions that have been built up. And I think right now as an individual, I would like my, the only way I can transform into dealing with and living with attachment wounds and because they're not going to go away, I think I, I'm going to have to continue to be my own mirror. For, for for the rest, I don't think that's going to ever go away now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and self-awareness is such an important tool for leadership as well. To be self-aware, but also be compassionate with yourself, but also be seeking to find ways to, to improve the way you are in the world is so, so important. All right, and um, what question would you like to leave for another one of our guests? One question I think I would leave for the next guest would be... Do you have goals or do you have intentions? That is that is a that is a wonderful question, Carmen, and we will be sure to ask it to a, to to one of our guests. Thank you very much for for all your time and um, for your candor and your generosity and in, in, in taking us in, on this journey. I know some of it must um, been painful to to remember, and I I really appreciate the journey that we've been on. No, thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to share, and um, thank you for giving me the platform. This was Gestoras. This episode of Gestoras was recorded in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco, California. This episode of Gestoras was hosted by me, Jimena Varela, and produced by Anush Titanian. Our theme song is Hace que exista, Make it Exist by Eli Almik. The graphic design is by Bia Silva. Gestoras is mixed and supported in part by the Arts Management Program at American University, Washington, D.C. For 50 years, the Arts Management Program at American University has been training leaders in the arts to change the world for the better. Find out more at artsmanagement.american.edu. Follow us on YouTube at Gestoras and on Facebook and Instagram at Gestoras Podcast. Thank you for listening and don't forget to like and subscribe.